I'm Jerry Flegel, President and CEO of the Hoover Presidential Foundation. Before I start the program, I'd like to share some upcoming events with you. This Saturday is a busy day at the Hoover campus, and I invite you to come and take part in the day's programs. We begin with our Uncommon Student Award presentation day. 15 Iowa high school seniors have been working all summer on community-oriented projects, and they will present their results all day this Saturday in the Figge Auditorium in the Hoover uh, Library Museum. You'll be amazed at what these students have accomplished. It begins at 9 a.m., ends at 5 p.m. and with presentations about every 20 minutes. I hope you'll come and watch a few of them, if not all this weekend. We'll live stream them uh, on our Facebook page as well, but it's going to warm up and be a great day to get out to the Hoover campus. Also on Saturday, we'll honor President Hoover's passing and internment here on a hilltop overlooking his birthplace home, which happened 58 years ago. We'll do this during the noon hour while the students take a lunch break. During the commemoration program, we'll have short remarks from Hoover Presidential Library Director Tom Schwartz and Hoover Historic Site Superintendent Pete Swisher and Leigh Reese from the Hoover family and the White House in honor of Herbert and Lou Henry Hoover. Our next third Thursday event features an author and Hoover National Historic Site Ranger, Peter Hanley. You've heard him present before, he's really good. He will present the Herbert Hoover and Christmas with a look at how Hoover celebrated the holiday during the many different stages of his life. You'll find all the details and a registration blank, or rather link rather, on our website, hooverpresidentialfoundation.org. And of course, there's lots of other things to see and do on the Hoover campus, so drop by anytime. The museum is open seven days a week from nine to five, as well as the National Historic Site and the historical buildings there. The blacksmith shop is up and running yet this month, and there are regular ranger talks each week. Visit the National Historic Sites website at mps.gov slash H-E-H-O and check out their online calendar. I hope you'll come and visit us soon with your whole family. Also on our website, you can learn about a major fundraising campaign for the renovation of the Hoover Presidential Library and Museum exhibit space. It's been 30 years since the last renovation, and we are excited about bringing new technology and other updates into the museum. We have a special benefit for Iowa taxpayers who contribute to the Timeless Values campaign, where you can earn a 25% Iowa State tax credit for your gift of any size, no matter how much the gift is. As for tonight's program, I encourage you to enter any questions you have for Paul in the Q&A link on the edge of your screen. You can even vote for someone else's question if it's of interest to you, as questions with more votes tend to get asked first, and we get usually a lot of questions. So I'm pleased to welcome author, teacher, and historian Paul Jewell to the program. Paul is a retired educator, teacher, counselor, and administrator in both public and private schools in Iowa and Switzerland. He's a collector of photographic images from the later decades of the 19th century, resulting in a large collection of stereographs and cabinet cards that are now housed at the State Historical Society of Iowa in Iowa City. He's done extensive research on Herbert Hoover and West Branch and has some very interesting historical photos of West Branch to share with us tonight. Growing up in West Branch, I am personally really looking forward to his presentation. The presentation tonight is called A Hoover Homecoming Photo Album, August 1928, and contains some images you've never seen before from Hoover's campaign visit. Paul, welcome to Third Thursday at Hoover's. Well, thank you very much, Jerry. I'm really happy to be a uh, part of the um, Herbert Hoover Presidential and, uh, Library and Museum presentation. Um, tonight, I'd like to share with you some photographs from a very special time in the lives of uh, the Hoover family. I hope you will enjoy my talk. Uh, I'm using numerous images uh, from the Presidential Library and Museum, and also a few that were taken by the Kent, uh, a man named Kent, and they're from the State Historical Society of Iowa. What I've tried to do here is to put together kind of a picture album uh, that this, 
Hoover's could have very well put together to remember the event. So let's go back to the summer of 1928. And this was just after the Republican convention that selected Mr. Hoover as their candidate in the fall election for president of the United States. And the lives of Mr. Hoover, uh, Lou Henry Hoover, his wife and their two sons would soon change drastically. But it was decided that before the election, they would make a homecoming trip to Iowa, the state where both Herbert Hoover and his wife, Lou, were born and where their individual stories began. They would start this Iowa Odyssey and Odyssey in West Branch, where Mr. Hoover was born, but they would also visit the Iowa cities of Iowa City, Cedar Rapids, and Waterloo during their very brief three-day trip. This was their chance to not only introduce their sons to Iowa, but also to see relatives and old friends. Now, just a little background to begin, and I know many of you know many more things about the Hoovers than I do. But Mr. Hoover was of course born in the Cedar County village of West Branch in 1874. And uh, not yet a teenager, uh, he moved to Oregon after he and his two siblings were orphaned. And Lou Henry Hoover was born in Waterloo and left that city when she was about 11 years old. And that was when her family moved to California in hopes of greater opportunities. Uh, the couple had met at Stanford University and they were married in 1899. And adventure was certainly part of those early years of their marriage when they moved to China and the Far East. Um, later, Mr. Hoover assumed governmental positions during the First World War. And, and in fact, at the time of his visit to West Branch in 1928, Mr. Hoover was serving as Secretary of Commerce under the administration of President Calvin Coolidge. Now for the Hoover's two sons, uh, this visit to Iowa after the really exciting uh, Kansas City Republican Convention was a chance to see the people and places that their parents had described to them over the years. Both Herbert Jr., who was 25, and Alan, who was 21, they were at the beginnings of their careers. Herbert Jr. already had a degree from Stanford in engineering, which he had obtained in 1925. He was married, and Alan was yet a college student. And the sons were looking forward to seeing the Iowa sites. So let's get started, and through photographs, we'll join the Hoovers in Iowa in 1928. Now this photo was actually taken the night before their arrival, their August 21st arrival. And there you can see volunteers uh, hoisting large banners uh, that appeared on several of the major streets. West Branch certainly wanted everyone to know that this was the birthplace of Mr. Hoover. Uh, this one was placed on uh, North Downey Street, I think just north of Main Street. Um, a second banner uh, here um, you can see was, uh, uh, this was taken probably on the morning of the visit. And this banner was near the intersection of Downey and Main Streets. And as I said, the intent was certainly clear to let everybody know that Mr. Hoover had been born here in West Branch. Uh, actually, the night before his arrival, there had been a really a strong windstorm and rainstorm. And uh, it, a lot of the buntings were taken down by the wind and uh, some of the flags. And so there was a quick effort to get everything in place and the sun was shining that next day. It was a bit of a sad time because just on July 18th, uh, Lou's father had passed away. Um, and so there was a, a feeling of mourning for, for the family. Well, the Hoovers came by train. And uh, here we see a, a large crowd of people milling around the train uh, just after it had pulled into the station. And West Branch citizens, of course, were really excited to see them. And the word quickly spread amongst the crowd that the Hoovers would be coming out of the rear of the train, the caboose. Um, a band had begun to play and 
crowd was all standing near this Rock Island train depot. Um, and for many, it, it meant rising rather early in the day in order to get the very best spot to see Mr. Hoover and Mrs. Hoover and their two sons. Uh, the depot building is there in the distance, it's shown in the background. And after the family arrived, there were some open air cars uh, that would take the Hoover family through the main uh, business district of the town. This is, it's kind of interesting too, that uh, it was always kind of an annoyance uh, on railroad maps for the people of West Branch uh, because West Branch didn't appear on the map. Uh, it went directly from West Liberty to Elmira. And so some of these men milling around were probably saying, uh, well, we're gonna get West Branch probably in capital letters on the map after this. Well, here is Mr. Hoover and he's pausing um, briefly uh, before he descends the stairs of this golden state, you can see the wording there, caboose. And this was just after the arrival in West Branch on August 21st, 1928. That L emblem that you see, it contains uh, oranges, which are quite appropriate for the Hoovers uh, because uh, for the most part now they called uh, the Golden State of California their, their home. Um, the remainder of the Hoover family, Mrs. Hoover, Herbert Jr. and Alan, uh, they would follow Mr. Hoover in leaving the train. Um, you note too that uh, Mr. Hoover was not, you can see his hat in his hand. Uh, he was not without that hat the entire day, although much of the time it was Alan that carried it for him, his son. Well, just after departing the train, you can see here the admiration really in the face of some of the townsmen of uh, West Branch. He's really looked upon in admiration by these men. And also note uh, in 1928, uh, when men went to a formal affair, they dressed uh, in their Sunday best uh, with their suits, even though it's August in Iowa, uh, and neckties but they wanted to look their best. They wanted to show um, uh, Mr. Hoover that uh, how they could look, even as the August sun shined down on them. It was a mark of respect. And among the my admirers uh, shown here, one is I think named uh, Harrison Spangler, one is Ben Rowland, and you just see the profile there on the extreme right of a man named Newt Butler. And, uh, Newt would be a person that had played a role in uh, Mr. Hoover's early life, and he was very proud to be there standing next to him, I'm sure. This was uh, Newt's business. It was on the north side of Main Street, um, and uh, he called it his uh, soda water place and pool hall. Now, of course, Prohibition had brought some changes to uh, this place of business. Um, the sign uh, that you can't see here, but it was on the north side, uh, it read Newt's Place, lunch, soft drinks, cigars, cigarettes. Now, Newt was the one that was quick to tell everybody who would listen. Uh, he once, and uh, sometimes some said, tw sometimes he would say twice, uh, he licked uh, Mr. Hoover in a fight when they were boys, uh, although now he certainly seemed to respect him. And it, later, Newt would be among the West Branch group that traveled to Washington, D.C. Uh, for Mr. Hoover's inauguration. In West Branch, however, Newt liked to call himself the town's only Democrat. And some said he actually wrote a little song titled, Goodbye Cal, Hello Al, calling to mind both President Calvin Coolidge and also the Democratic candidate running against Mr. Hoover, Al Smith. The West Branch teacher of both Newt Butler and Herbert Hoover was a woman named Molly Brown Karen. And she did have some things to say about this man, Newt Butler. She once said that even talking about Butler, and these are her words, just makes me tired. And another time when asked of the fight between Butler and Hoover, she said, Herbie never looked for trouble 
but he could and would fight if picked on. If Newt Butler really fought Herbie, as he says he did, I'm not so sure Newt won. Well, here the family is seen uh, loading into that six passenger vehicle, uh, an open air um, vehicle. Uh, the Rock Island Depot is there off to the left. And again, you see the crowd, mainly men um, that are standing around. Uh, these other cars that you see near the official car are other cars that would join in the caravan that would go uh, down the main street of West Branch. And a little closer view of the car. And there you see Mr. Hoover and Mrs. Hoover. Um, it would soon snake its way through the streets of West Branch. And they were headed for the birthplace home of Mr. Hoover. Well, all the way, all along the way, and you can see one doing that right here, old friends would lean forward, forward with a greeting for the couple. Um, in front of Mr. Hoover is his grade school teacher. I mentioned her before, Mrs. Karen. She sits in front of the Hoovers. Now the family and uh, his old teacher, Molly Brown Karen, had been invited uh, to uh, the original birthplace of Mr. Hoover for breakfast. Um, and Mrs. Karen had also been invited. Mrs. Karen had on a black outfit that day with coral beads, it's been recorded. And most photos of Molly Brown Karen show her as an older woman um, and came from the time really of the Hoover's visit in 1928. But this image uh, was taken near the time that she served as Herbert Hoover's teacher in the third or fourth grades. She was known for discipline, but she was also known for compassion. And Mr. Hoover considered her to be one of the reasons he had succeeded in life. Uh, when the children were orphaned, when Herbert Hoover was orphaned, Molly Brown at that time, uh, Molly Brown Karen, even offered to take him in and raise him herself. Their relationship uh, was that close. Uh, it is also recorded that only one other time, uh, Molly did go along uh, to um, Washington with the group after the election, and only one other time did she contact, that we know of, that did she contact Mr. Hoover, and that was during the Depression. Uh, she had a son looking for a job and asked Mr. Hoover if he could help in any way to get a federal job. And uh, uh, Mrs. Karen's son was uh, appointed to a postal position. Well, this, of course, is the way uh, the birthplace house looked in 1928. Um, the original house is that one story uh, building there off to the right. Um, it had been changed um, over the years. Uh, this two-story section of the home had been attached uh, some years uh, after the Hoovers had, had moved out of it uh, to enlarge the home. And at that time, there was a Mrs. Jenny Skellers who was living there. Um, the original home there was 14 by 20 feet, I think. Um, and Mrs. Skellers was really looking forward to uh, serving them breakfast in that original part of the building, uh, the two room part that Mr. Hoover would have been born in. Um, she had planned a really authentic menu, an uh, authentic Iowa menu, I should say. She was going to have sliced peaches and cream, um, powdered biscuits um, with honey or strawberry jam, um, ham and eggs, and some fried potatoes. And in fact, those fried potatoes had come out of her garden uh, that very morning. And here you see the cottage, of course, as, as it looks today. And it's really the centerpiece for the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site. Um, 
When they left the house, Mrs. Skellers had a gift for the Hoovers. Uh, and that gift was a cane that had been carved out of, uh, it, it was shaped like a corn stalk and it had been carved out of wood from the original cottage when some remodeling was done. Now, Mrs. Sellers lived in this house until uh, she died in 1934 at the age of 70. And visitors to the house, one time they estimated there might have been 35,000 visitors by the summer of 1931. Uh, she charged a little bit to come into the house and look around. Um, some called her the Herbert House Hostess, and uh, she also sold some postcards. This is a favorite photo of mine, and I'm sure it will be of yours too. This was taken by the portion of the building where Mr. Hoover had been born, and it shows uh, Mr. Hoover and, and uh, Mrs. Hoover, and Herbert Jr. is there on the left, and Alan is on the right. Um, this is where they ate breakfast that morning, and uh, note that in addition to the cane, Mrs. Kellers had cut some gladiolas from her garden, and she presented them to um, Mrs. Hoover. Now they knew, these four people standing there, that they went for some busy days in Iowa, there, that would be ahead for them, uh, but they were stood ready to really see everything they could. After, the bre after breakfast, this was the first stop along the way. Um, they first wanted to visit the cemetery where Mr. Hoover's parents were buried. And here they found these two modest stones at the burial site of Jesse and Hulda Hoover. At that, on that day, there was a beautiful wreath between the two stones that had been given uh, by an organization that Hulda felt strongly about, the Women's Christian Temperance Union. The crowd kind of stayed back as the four in the Hoover party uh, stepped forward, trying to give them a little privacy. They stood quietly for a short time. You can see here the inscription on Jesse Hoover's stone read, come unto me, ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give, thee, give ye rest. Uh, several times actually during the day, tears came to Mr. Hoover's eyes when he would remember the pain of the loss of his parents and the feelings he had of being an orphan uh, during those final years in West Branch. Well, next up was an attempt to find the old swimming hole that was uh, now along this uh, waterway that was now being called the Hoover Creek. Well, of course, that small stream that Mr. Hoover and his uh, comrades had uh, enjoyed, had meandered a lot over the 40 years. Uh, so none of them were really sure exactly where it had been. Everybody, fought, all of them, a lot of men followed them out to see if they could find the swimming hole. And each had kind of a different idea of, uh, of where it was. Most were certain uh, because someone had told them that it was by the rail tracks and willow trees. And Mr. Hoover remembered it in much the same fashion. He also remembered that it was always quite muddy and the boys that swam in the old swimming hole had to wash themselves thoroughly after a swim in the creek. Well, it took a lot of searching, uh, but Mr. Hoover now and this photo stands near the location of what he felt might be the old swimming hole. You know, as you sit here and look at him, you just wonder what he was thinking as he stood alone at that site, uh, remembering those happy times of messing around in the mud and swimming so long ago. Well, the local high school kind of served as the headquarters for the entire operation uh, during the visit of the Hoovers. Um, and here you can see with uh, smiles and quickness of step, Mr. and Mrs. Hoover uh, are exiting uh, the 
uh, West Branch Schoolhouse. Um, it's also where all the radio broadcasting was being set up uh, for the speech um, that Mr. Hoover would be giving. And it's also adjacent to two large tents uh, that he would be speaking in. Here you see some of the students uh, forming a pathway. Many of them have stalks of corn. That seemed to be the symbol of the visit. And many of them are also wearing what were called Hoover dresses. I tried to find if any of those still existed, but I had no luck with that. But these young people that were standing next to the Hoovers would certainly long remember this day. And here with the corn stalks uh, forming an arc, uh, they continued out of the West Branch High School after a short visit there. Uh, with the uh, excitement that only you can bring, uh, the students, boys and girls, were shouting um, shouts of joy. It's a little difficult, as, as I said, to see these Hoover dresses. We don't really see them in this one or the corn stalks. Um, but as I said, many were shouting Hoover for president, and they hoped they might be photographed with Mr. or Mrs. Hoover. And the two Hoover sons followed their parents out of the building and really quite amazed at the outpouring of affection uh, from the um, young people. Well, since this was a homecoming celebration, um, organizers decided that they would have a um, reunion with some of his schoolmates. And here, Mr. Hoover, uh, seated in the center, of course, is shown with his West Branch classmates and two of their teachers uh, who were seated on either side of Mr. Hoover. Um, the one there to uh, the left in the photo is of course, Molly Brown, Karen. The other teacher to um, the right in the photo might be Mrs. Sanir. She was his first grade teacher and was living in uh, Iowa City. One of the teachers said that Mr. Hoover's favorite subject they thought was uh, math. They all had lots of stories to tell about Mr. Hoover when they had known him as a young boy. And of course, he liked to tell stories himself about his early years. Um, a few of these classmates still lived in West Branch, but most of them had traveled uh, many miles for this reunion. With the exception of the two teachers, I would guess that most of the people assembled here were about 54 years of age uh, when the photo was taken. And of course, it was a great day to be a Hoover. Um, in fact, some people called it Hoover Day. And these are some of Mr. Hoover's relatives. Um, many of them uh, bore the name Hoover, some were Pembertons. Um, actually, on the reverse of this photo that had been given to Mr. Hoover, uh, someone had written, I thought you might like this photo of your aunts and uncles. The occasion was probably a picnic dinner uh, that was reserved um, for uh, just members of the family. Um, it was held at the Yoder farm. It was a lunch, a picnic lunch. Um, and some of the women were wearing a, even a, a Hoover apron. Um, it was done um, before the major speech that Mr. Hoover would be giving that evening. And of course, his relatives were very proud of the accomplishments of their kinsmen. And as the day went on, more and more people were coming in on the trains. They were all interested in Mr. Hoover's speech um, that evening. And there were concession stands all around the grounds. Uh, especially popular were cold drinks that they were being served in big tubs of ice. And the evening meal that they had um, before uh, he spoke uh, was again a typical Iowa one with lots of fried chicken and uh, certainly lemonade. Well, there were the two school buildings you see here kind of on the hill. 
um, that were dominant, um, but they had put in these massive tents that had been erected on what is now a football field in West Branch. Uh, some said the large tents had come from a circus in the area, they were so big, but others said they had been borrowed from a Chautauqua that was passing by. At any rate, they were large enough uh, for the thousands of people who had come to West Branch to hear Mr. Hoover speak. Uh, the tents were off the ground, you can see raised off the ground. That allowed for good ventilation, and it also made it easier for those assembled on the grass surrounding the tents to hear what was being said inside. Uh, this area is now uh, where the local football teams uh, play their games. And this is a really rare photograph of the interior of one of the big tents uh, before any of the people were seated. Uh, boards were placed on hollow cement bricks and that provided some comfort, and of course no backs on those, but some comfort for the 15,000 people that they thought could attend. Uh, the large supporting poles are seen to keep the structure in place. And people entering, um, because it was recessed area, they had to descend into the tent structure as the floor was lower uh, than the ad adjoining land. Of course, everybody wanted to get there early to position themselves to get the very best view of the nominee Mr. Hoover and his family members. And not everyone was able to find a seat, uh, so there were lots of late arrivals. But if they brought a blanket, uh, they had plenty of room. Um, and the hot August day had actually started to cool down a little bit when Mr. Hoover began to speak. And it seemed to be relatively comfortable for all involved. Many were really interested in what uh, the politicians that preceded Mr. Hoover's speech had to say. And there was also some musical entertainment for all to enjoy. Um, preparations by the various committees in West Branch had made this uh, entire experience enjoyable for all. One of the singers was a young woman that had just returned from Europe, uh, an Iowan, uh, Ilsa, Nemec, um, she played uh, the violin. And at one point she played our familiar Iowa corn song. Um, we're from Iowa, Iowa, that's where the tall corn grows. Well, the large assembly seemed to erupt when Mr. Hoover uh, finally entered. And he delivered that speech in the early evening hours and spent part of the speech uh, just reminiscing about his childhood. Uh, they had a wooden platform there uh, created for him and his family and some of the other honored guests. And in front of the lectern uh, is a um, microphone um, equipment that would broadcast his speech uh, to millions uh, over the radio. And as I said, many of the uh, honored guests, mainly politicians, had also given short speeches during the afternoon. And most were on the uh, issues of farming and farm uh, related policies. Uh, many of these same people would later meet in uh, Cedar Rapids on the following day to discuss their uh, ideas and concerns. The evening ended with the whole group singing All Lang Syne. They also sang the Star Spangled Banner. It was not yet our national anthem. That came later uh, during uh, Mr. Hoover's presidency. There was just ovation upon ovation. Um, since there were no, uh, at that time, the, the, any lodging was totally full. Uh, so the Hoover family spent the night with their relative, the Yoder family. Well, another really interesting part of this story, and you're wondering right now, why is he putting a football player uh, in this story? But um, this man is named Fred, and he was always known as Duke Slater. And Mr. Slater had a concession stand that same day near those large tents I just showed you, and he was selling chicken sandwiches. And at that time, he was just finishing up his law degree at the University of Iowa. 
which he had achieved in 1928. Well, Mr. Slater went on to play professional football and was later a judge in the city of Chicago for over 20 years. Uh, he was an Iowan. He came from Clinton, Iowa, where he was a, an athlete and was on the 1918 to 1921 football team for Iowa. Oh, he had many honors over the years. College Football Hall of Fame, Pro Football Hall of Fame, first African-American lineman in NFL history, six-time All-Pro selection, first-team All-American. One would doubt if the Hoover family met Mr. Slater during this time in West Branch, but one could probably be assured that Mr. Hoover would have felt strongly about a young man working so hard to pay his tuition at the university. There's a dormitory at the University of Iowa named in his honor, and uh, just recently, within the last year, I think, uh, they named the football field itself uh, in honor of Duke Slater. Well, um, after spending the night in the home of, with the relatives of Yoders in West Branch, the Hoovers left the next morning in a, a ca cavalcade, motorcade for Iowa City, the home of the University of Iowa and the former state capital of Iowa. It was just a short drive of 10 miles, but just outside the city limits, they noticed a boy whose name was Bobby Farr, and he was waving a banner, and Mr. Hoover asked if they could stop and he could meet the boy. Well, Bobby was so honored and told the newspaper people that if I were old enough to vote, I'd be voting for Mr. Hoover. And you can see there that he has a, a physical handicap. It was hard for him to walk. Well, the Farr family then went on to Cedar Rapids and waited on a bridge for a second look at the Hoover family. And Mr. Hoover spotted him again and waved. A few months later, Bobby sent a letter to Mr. Hoover along with a newspaper photo of the two of them meeting along the road. He said he liked listening to the speeches Mr. Hoover made and was able to do so by hooking up to a neighbor's radio. He also told of being sick in bed at the time. Well, a short time later, Mr. Hoover wrote back to Bobby and wished him a speedy recovery and told him something was coming in the mail. Well, a few days later, Bobby got a big box in the mail and it was a radio set. And the family said they would never forget Mr. Hoover's kindness. Well, the caravan went through large crowds along its official route and uh, you can see here they were at what we used to call the Whetstone Corner. Uh, that was a corner of Washington Street um, and Clinton Street. Um, and just a, two or three minutes after this photo was taken, um, Mr. and Mrs. Hoover would disembark and they would walk to the east entrance of the old stone capitol. And here we see Mr. Hoover, uh, George T. Baker, who was president of the Iowa Board of Education. And by the way, there's a dormitory at UNI named in his honor. Also President Walter Jessup of the university and of course, Mrs. Hoover. They paused for a few minutes before entering the old stone Capitol building. And Mr. Hoover was really eager to see the change in the building because renovation was done just a few years before, I think in about 1922. They also went out the west entrance after the tour and looked out at what would one day be the large West Campus of the university where they have the sports and the medical facilities. One thing that Lou did remember about the building uh, was this beautiful, old, unique staircase. Of course, if you've ever been in the old capital, it's something you don't forget. It's spiral and beautiful and was built in the 1840s. Well, the time in Iowa City was brief. And then the party uh, went on to Cedar Rapids, about 20 miles to the north. Well, Cedar Rapidians, they were also eager for a look at the Republican candidate for president. And all along the route within the city, the lampposts were decorated with this large ear of corn poster and a likeness of Mr. Hoover on the top. Here, a young man named Robert Morton is adjusting one of the, these colorful displays. Unfortunately, the black and white doesn't show it as nicely. Again, that corn symbol, source of pride for Iowans, and uh, thus they now connected it with the pride in their native son. 
the Hoovers were on their way to a large home called Bruce Moore, which was at 2160 Linden Drive Southeast. You can see the crowds. Um, this was a new department store, uh, Newman's, uh, that had just recently purchased a previous store there called Denikis. Um, You'll see the flags of welcome that, and of the United States that blew in the breeze. Air was really full of excitement, a deafening sound of whistling, whistles and hand clapping and yelling. And the streets were full of uh, flags and banners. They were throwing confetti off some of the tops of the buildings. Even airplanes were circling ahead. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see Mr. Hoover's profile and Mrs. Hoover's distinct hat uh, in the back seat of the car as it inched along uh, first, just off First Avenue. Uh, the Bruce Moore would be the Hoover's home base for the night. And I'm sure they were looking for a little time away from the crowds of people. What's interesting about a couple of these photos, they were taken um, just with a little brownie camera, but on the back, they said they were taken by Mrs. C.P. Jewell, J-U-H-L. Well, I'm P.C. Jewell, J-U-H-L. Um, I don't think there's any relationship, but when I first saw it, I thought, well, that was unusual. Um, uh, someone by my, the same name I have um, at one point taking pictures of Mr. Hoover. And here is Bruce Moore. Uh, it's very impressive, 40 acre estate uh, owned by Mrs. George Douglas. And it was about two miles from the city center. Um, they were greeted by Mr. and Mrs. Howard Hall. She was the daughter of Mrs. Douglas. Uh, the rest of the Douglas at that time, they summered at, they had a home in Charlevoix, Michigan. And of course, the co-band had come out. Uh, they'd been in West Branch, but they came on to Cedar Rapids. They were part of the celebration co-college band. Um, but before they even came up to the house, uh, there was a kids parade of uh, thousands of, of kids uh, that paraded by. Um, a lot were Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. And of course, the Girl Scout organization was very dear to Mrs. Hoover. And some of those Girl Scouts presented her with bouquets of flowers. Um, and she sat on the Bruce Moore lawn with them and sang some songs that would be familiar to them. And here the Hoovers are chatting quietly with dignitaries in the reviewing stand. And you see some of these young people uh, lined up in their Girl Scout outfits um, to get a good look at Mr. and Mrs. Hoover. Other groups were campfire girls walked by, pioneers walked by, YMCA kids, Sunday school children, and even children from nearby communities and farms. Well, later that same afternoon, the family would break up and Mr. Hoover was attending meetings in Cedar Rapids at the uh, Roosevelt, Roosevelt Hotel and uh, Lou Hoover and her two sons traveled to Waterloo uh, by car, uh, her place of birth and hometown. And you can just see Mrs. Hoover kind of right through that side window there. And she was so pleased to be driven through the streets that she had known as a girl. Uh, it's also very pleasing for her to be able to show her two sons some of the places she had talked about over the years. Um, then following the tour, um, she had some speaking and, and greeting obligations uh, to do. This house um, had actually been torn down two years before the visit. It was torn down in 1926, but this was the house that most believed um, Lou Henry had been born in. Originally, it was a private home and its location in Waterloo later became a business district. And at the time of this photo, it was operated by, you can see a high Wart Wartley, uh, an, an interior decorator who sold paint and wallpaper. Um, but uh, they did visit this site where the building had been. And now there are two bronze statues actually there uh, to commemorate it. It's right by the freeway that goes through the city. Uh, here is one of those two statues. Um, this one is uh, uh, one that was done by Chris Bennett from um, Bettendorf. Uh, shows her sitting on a wicker chair with her left hand resting on a globe. 
And the other one, she's standing, um, and it was done in 2004 by John Jago. But the destination was a place called the Snowden House. And that was the home of the Waterloo Women's Club where Mrs. Hoover and her two sons were to have lunch. Uh, the house was once a private home, but it, it proved to really be a perfect setting for this occasion. And Mrs. Hoover said in a really gracious manner, a few words to the group assembled on the lawn. Uh, there were also invitations to take part uh, uh, of the inside activities, uh, and they were much sought after, of course. Uh, the house is still standing in Waterloo. It's part of the Grout Historical Group, um, but is no longer the location of the Waterloo Women's Club. Lou, didn't, Lou Hen, Henry Hoover didn't like public speaking much, but of course she did a wonderful job. Uh, here she begins her speech, um, microphone in front, as she looked out at a large group on the lawn of the Snowden House. Uh, her words being amplified, and the porch there you can see is surrounded with flowers and ferns. The crowd hushed immediately and waited for every word she would speak. Uh, the women of Waterloo, some of whom knew Mrs. Hoover as a young classmate and playmate, were exceedingly proud of her many accomplishments in world travels. She could speak, I think, five languages, including Chinese, and had a degree in geology from Stanford. Um, they held a strong desire that she would, in the coming months, uh, be the first lady of the land. Now later, um, some of those same uh, former classmates would gather at the Russell Lamson Hotel in downtown Waterloo. And Mrs. Hoover was really looking forward to this. Um, she would be able to see some of her former teachers. She would be able to visit with her former uh, classmates. But before that, she did, um, she was with the group inside the Snowden House. And this is a group of the women's club. And they took a picture and Mrs. Hoover is in it. And if you can find her, she's in kind of that back row, about the eighth from the left, she has on a black hat. And the woman right in front of her has on a hat with a large emblem of some kind of it, uh, of some kind on it. Um, I did send this picture to the Waterloo Women's Club, thinking that some of their current members uh, might be able to identify uh, their grandparents, perhaps or great grandparents, uh, but I never heard back from them. Um, some of the women are bareheaded with hats in their laps, but keeping with the fashion of the day and wearing a hat uh, was what was, was in, in terms of fashion. Um, and with suffrage only a few years before, many of these women were really more eager to take a political role. Well, the trip to Waterloo took only, they only stayed four hours um, and Mr. Hoover uh, was working all of that time at the Hotel Roosevelt uh, in um, Cedar Rapids. So Mrs. Hoover and her sons left Waterloo to return to Cedar Rapids and rejoin Mr. Hoover. And then they would leave the next morning to begin campaigning for the presidency. Well, they were exhausted, but they had many, many memories uh, of this very short visit. The next morning on their way out of um, Cedar Rapids, the Hoovers made one final stop. And this was to see the really stunning and beautiful stained glass window that had just been completed uh, in the Veterans Memorial Building on Mays Island. It contained 10,000 individual pieces of stained glass and was said to be the largest stained glass in America at that time. And of course it was done by Cedar Rapids and Iowa's own uh, Grant Wood. Here you see the Lady of Peace, and six soldiers representing the wars up until 1928 on the bottom. And it had been done in Germany. Grant Wood had gone there to work on it in Germany with the superb German uh, stained glass makers. And it was completed, as I said, at the time of the visit. On the very final slide I will show you, this is outside of the elementary school in West Branch. I love it. It was done in 2017. 
It honors Mr. Hoover, and it reminds those West Branch students every day who pass by of the importance of uh, Herbert Hoover in their United States history. So I thank you for your attention today. I really enjoyed doing the research on this project. I'd really like to thank uh, not only Jerry, but Brad and Tom, Spencer, Matt, and all of the others at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum uh, for allowing me to use the images and being part of this project. So now I will go out of my share, I hope, Jerry, and bring you up again. Okay. Well, um, I, you know, Paul's great presentation and uh, the pictures I find particularly interesting. And we got a few questions if, uh, and we got a few minutes if you don't mind ask, uh, answering those. Well, I'll try to answer them. I don't okay. know whether I'll, I'll well, well, it's, sounds, it's a good job. Well, sounds good. The first one is that, you know, pretty, this, this guy's pretty tough and mean, but that's uh, Dr. Tom Schwartz. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Anyway, Tom, Tom put down, he says, critics then and now argue that Hoover was cold and alof, aloof without humor or warmth for people. Yet these images clearly show such characterizations are false. Why didn't Hoover allow images like these to be used in the campaign? Well, that's a good question. I, I didn't even know that he didn't uh, use any of the images in, in the campaign, uh, but I thought he, he should have um, because they do portray a very warm family, uh, the, the entire family. I just thought they were having such a good time in those uh, three days. Uh, he had been back a couple of times before, uh, after he had left as, as an orphan, um, but this was a special time because now he was running uh, for the presidency of the United States and um, everybody was so proud and continue to be proud of this man and his family. Yep. Well, the next question or uh, comment we got is uh, actually from a Hoover descendant. Uh, Tamala Pink, uh, she's in Cedar Rapids, and she goes, the Roosevelt Hotel in Cedar Rapids, you know, the room where uh, uh, Herbert Hoover dined in was renamed the Hoover Room, and she goes, the last time I was in the Hoover Room was in 1992. She goes, I don't know if the door still has the nameplate on the door or not, but that, that, that is very interesting on that as well. Well, many changes have been made in the Roosevelt Hotel over the years, so yeah. I, I don't, I can't answer that. Right. And then uh, uh, Tom Schwartz also asked, he goes, Mrs. Hoover loved photography and took many photographs of their rural travels. Are you familiar with her images at all? Well, I'm not. And I wish you would have had her camera along on this visit to West Branch. Wouldn't that have been <laughs> fun to see West Branch and Waterloo and Iowa City, uh, Cedar Rapids through her eyes and her camera lens. Um, but I'm not familiar, I'm not familiar with those. I'm sure I've seen some over the years, but uh, um, I'm glad to hear that she was a photographer. Yeah, in fact, uh, <clears throat> I think she shot the first uh, uh, color mo uh, home movies in the White House uh, on there uh, while they were in the presidency on that. So, well, by the way, too, there is, um, if you go to Bruce Moore, they have some short films. And one of the films they have uh, shows First Avenue on the way to Bruce Moore up the lane and it shows uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hoover greeting the crowds there. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hoover uh, uh, was good friends with, uh, I think, Howard Hall that uh, uh, was living there at Bruce Moore at the time. In fact, in 1962, uh, later on, when they uh, dedicated the Hoover Presidential Library Museum, uh, both he and Harry Truman uh, stayed there that night. Uh, on that. So uh, interesting tidbit on that. So, well, Paul, question I would have is what motivated you to do the, the book and, uh, and the subject on this? What, uh, you know, because you, you've had, you can do a lot of different things. You're, uh, you know, you do a lot of things with photography and studying those things. What, what uh, prompted you to do this? Well, I've done a lot of spiral bound books on uh, Iowa topics, uh, but living here in Iowa City, uh, I always, I like to go out to the presidential uh, uh, library and museum, the 80 acres they have there. I just like to walk through it um, or I like to have a picnic there. Um, so it was always something that I, I kind of wanted to do to, in, uh, to write or research about Herbert Hoover. And uh, then it just came to me. I read probably in a newspaper that they had come back for this homecoming in 28. And I found myself wondering, well, I wonder how many photos were taken that day or what that day was like. Um, 
everything I write about is Iowa. So I've written about uh, Abraham Lincoln's grandchildren and their Mount Pleasant connection. I've written about McKinley Cantor, a Pulitzer Prize a novelist from Webster City. Um, so Herbert Hoover just naturally fit in there. And I was so pleased I could do something. I, I really consider him to be um, a fine person. And uh, when you're researching somebody of uh, that, that those with those qualities, it's a joy. Mm -hmm. Well, I, yeah, I, I find the um, uh, your, your pictures and, and I've had a chance to uh, um, look at your book on there. And I would uh, recommend uh, anybody that has any interest in that. Uh, those books, I think, are available at the uh, uh, Hoover Library and Museum at their gift shop on there. And I think Paul's designated uh, pretty generously a lot of the uh, any of the profits uh, off of that are going to go to the uh, Hoover Library on there. So. All of the profits, yep. whatever it's sold for, everything goes to the uh, foundation. I'm excited about the changes that are going to be made, and I, I fully support them in any way I can. Yeah, no, I, well, we greatly appreciate that. And uh I've had a chance to uh, uh, go through the book. Um, I was traveling out to California last week, so that entertained me on the way back. And, and of course, my uh, person sitting in the seat uh, started asking questions about it too as, as she was looking over my shoulder. But, uh, you know, it's a very interesting book. Uh, some great pictures in there. Uh, Paul touched upon a lot of them, but there's still even more there. And uh, what I also like too is that he took pictures of where what it was then, but then also what it is now. And I find that just very interesting on there. So anyway. Yeah, I've got some sections in there called remains to be seen, uh, which are simply things that the Hoover saw in 1928 that we can still see today. Yep, exactly, exactly. So, and uh, in fact, some of those buildings on Main Street, we were, we were uh, trying to identify those. We actually had a, uh, uh, a member or a person from uh, town here, uh, Buzz Alban, uh, uh, well, actually, I, uh, I lived next to as my uh, my parents uh, when I was in high school, and Buzz actually brought in a photograph, black and white photograph, um, of that day that Hoover was here yesterday when he was in. And it's a in fact we got to take it down to the library, and make sure that uh, they've got a copy. If not, they're going to get one. But it's got it's about uh, Herbert Hoover in the open car on there, and it's an angle that wasn't in your book, so. There may be a picture that uh, is just newly discovered on that. It was taken by obviously one of his, one of his uh, relatives on there, but it was really interesting. It's like, you know, the clarity of the picture was just amazing on it. So uh, anyway, but yeah, it was always interesting to discover those things. So, well, Paul, I got to uh, thank you so much for uh, coming on and doing this. And again, if anybody is interested, please feel free to go down to the Library Museum here in West Branch. Uh, and the gift shop, and Paul has copies of that book there, and uh, you can pick some up there, and like, like Paul said, all the uh, proceeds will go to the uh, museum renovation uh, campaign on that, so again, thank you so much, Paul. For, for thank you, Jerry. Thank you very much. On, on there, so, so that's all the time we got for questions for now, and I'd like to thank our guest again, Paul Jewell, for sharing some very interesting historical photos of West Branch tonight, and also all the public libraries that joined in as well. Now remember, the Presidential Library is now open seven days a week from nine to five, and I invite you to visit a new temporary exhibit now open called Deliverance, America and the Famine in Soviet Russia, 1921 to 1923, featuring accounts of numerous humanitarian efforts by Herbert Hoover and the ARA as they worked to feed 11 million people a day 100 years ago fascinating story uh, subject and uh, especially with everything that is going on uh, with Russia and Ukraine uh, it, it's uh, timely today as well so and also I just remind you don't forget to join us November 17th for our next third Thursday program where we'll hear from Ranger Peter Hanley about Christmas with the Hoovers the Hoover Presidential Foundation staff is ready to assist you with your membership needs or charitable gifts in support of the Hoover campus and the museum renovation you can also learn more about that and even show your support at timelessvaluescampaign.org. On behalf of all of us here at the Hoover campus and the participating public libraries, we thank you for joining us and look forward to your next visit to the Hoover campus. Good evening. <music>